Welcome back to the Crosswalk.com Inside the Editor's Room podcast. I'm Stephen McGarvey, the Editor-in-Chief of Crosswalk.com, and I'm joined by my usual cast of co-hosts, uh, Rachel Dawson, our Design Editor, Kelly Gibbons, our Senior Editor, and Sean McAvoy, our Managing Editor. And I got, think I got all your names and titles right. So. <laughs> <laughs> Extremely Senior Editor. Extremely. <laughs> uh, so... This week's episode, we wanted to talk about books, because we all love books to one degree or another. Uh, we've got summer coming up, so it's, a, uh, it's usually a time in people's lives where they have a little bit more um, uh, space for reading, especially for fun reading that maybe they've been putting off uh, all year long. All my Facebook friends are asking for recommendations for Aren't their they? upcoming beach trip. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Excellent. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, we have also varying degrees of interest in beaches in this room, so yeah, that's right. we wouldn't necessarily call it uh, a beach read. Bake in the sun? <laughs> yummy. <laughs> I prefer my summer reading in the mountains, mm-hmm. under, a, <laughs> under a cloudy sky. Absolutely. But Kelly prefers the beach. Yep. I do. Scorch me, sun. <laughs> <laughs> so what we're going to do is we, we have three categories we, we want to talk about. Where We've each brought three books uh, that are our favorites uh, that we'll divide into three categories. And Kelly, why don't you uh, start us off by telling what those categories are? Yeah, so I think first we're going to talk about childhood favorites. These are ones that you just kind of delighted in as a little kid. And um, when you think about what you read as a kid, maybe you're one of the first that come to mind. And then the second category is one that you reread every year. So this is something that could still be from childhood that you come back to as an adult or just something that you found maybe later in life that has really stuck with you and you just enjoy coming back to again and again. And then our third, like we talked about, will be our summer read. So not necessarily a beach read, but <laughs> one that you um, think maybe is more light. You don't have to have a highlighter in hand when you read it. Um, <laughs> just something you enjoy that you would want to recommend to others if they ask. Although we are opening this up to, to fix Fiction, nonfiction, whatever, oh, right? Whatever yeah, meant something to us. People definitely have different tastes, and some people prefer only nonfiction, some only prefer yeah. prefer fiction. So, yeah, it'll be fun to talk about it. Um, so, Sean, uh, let's get, start with you, and let's talk about your childhood favorite. Oh, gosh. This might date me a little bit. Okay. But uh, um, when I was a kid, I was trying to think of what, what really meant something to me. What did I kind of go to over and over? The Judy Bloom books were very popular mm-hmm. when I was I was young, and the most popular of those was Tales of a Fourth Grade Nothing, mm-hmm. and that was a, a book that stuck with me over and over again. And I, I, I was trying to think of why, and um, it was it any deep meaning. No, it was mostly that she just wrote the... The two-year-old little brother Fudge so hilariously <laughs> that uh, I, I just really like the idea of this this poor kid having an antagonist younger brother who everyone doted on and, and how it made him feel probably because I had a, a younger sibling as well so it was something I could really relate to and, and yet it wasn't too heavy uh, like some of Judy's other books about mm-hmm. you know life's big issues uh, which I wasn't ready for yet so <laughs> and probably still aren't <laughs> yeah well we'll see we'll see what some of my other books have to reveal about that but, sure yeah. Sure. Cool. That's awesome. I read those books when I was a kid, too. But I was a bigger fan of the sequel to Super Tales Fudge? of the Fourth Grade Nothing. Yeah, mm-hmm. Super Fudge, which I thought was an amazing title for a book. It was. Even when I was in third grade and reading that stuff. So, <laughs> good times. Steve, what did you pick? Well, it's, this is like this process for me, because I love books so much, is like trying to pick my favorite kid. So, um, it's it, when I look back at what I read as a kid, like different times of my life were very distinct in the different things. But um, I feel like as far as what I have what I read probably in elementary school and then what I keep going back to at different stages in my life is C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia. Mm-hmm. And my favorite book of that series is The Silver Chair. Now, I know a lot of people who love that series and love Narnia and love Lewis, n- no one picks The Silver Chair as their favorite <laughs> book. And it is kind of, it is one of the more dark uh uh, stories. It, it, there's there's a lot of there, there's a lot of despair. You see this um, this character that was in his younger years uh, a hero um, fall on hard times basically, and it, the story sort of jumps into the later later in his life when you you realize he, there's not been things haven't been all great for him. So he's experienced triumph and he's experienced failure, and um, it's 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 sort of a great for me. It's each of those books has a different tone, but that one has a tone that just 
always really struck with me. I always went back to that one. I think as a kid, I read it four or five times, wow. and um, it's it's just a uh, it's it's a nice center point to that whole series um, for what it you know what it teaches about life. And um, I recently read it to my son a couple of years ago, and it's still it was I had it'd been about ten years or so since I'd read it, and it's still sort of held that really. Uh, really engaging theme of like looking at your life and and trying to figure out okay what you know what what went right what went wrong and it, through the eyes of people who are kind of like following this character and this Prince Caspian basically yeah um, it's just one that it's, that's always stuck with me I've always remembered a little bit more uh, than than the other ones and as a kid for some reason I couldn't put that into words as a kid but for sure. as a kid I just I just loved it I kept reading it over and over again. It's actually interesting you mention um, Narnia and trying to get your kids to read it and not really being into it. I'll jump in and talk about my favorite because I was trying to think through this and I at first I thought of all the books like the series books like American Girls and Babysitters Club and oh, sure. Boxcar Children just these really earnest oh, Boxcar Children I know. that was the book that got me started into reading yeah my I mom it. got it and made me read it and I turns out I I loved it I actually did I, I didn't expect to but I did yeah they're so they're all like really very sweet and earnest books and then but what I thought of and I was and I thought, ooh, I want to talk about this, is the Lewis Sacker series, um, the Wayside School series. I don't know if any of you I don't know. Read. Is that oh, like Babysitter's Club? So, <laughs> so not at all. So, um, yeah, he wrote Holes. So you might oh, yeah. read that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But this is like a, maybe a lesser known series from him. And they're just very peculiar and humorous and very surreal. It's about this school that was built um, 30 stories high, a classroom on each story. Have you read them, Rachel? Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. Okay, love yeah. these. It's coming back to me now. <laughs> yes, and um, it talks about like each chapter is devoted to a different kid in the classroom, and they're doing like pretty normal things, but in that, um, it's just very odd, and there's funny turns of phrase, and there's just these oddities that go on that um, are so delightful, and he just continually like kind of winks at the reader and like makes you mm-hmm. like without really telling you what's funny or weird, like kind of this, you get a sense of that, which I just delighted in as a kid. Um, like what for one example, he has the principal. Is just constantly telling the kids, like, you, you're you always blocking up the stairwell. If everyone would just walk up on the right and down on the left, like, we wouldn't have this problem. <laughs> and so he never comes out and says, like, why that's, like, causing the problem. But you, he's kind of winking at the reader, like, if you're, you're clever enough to, like, figure out what's going on here. Um, and so they're just super silly and fun. And as a kid, it was my really my first experience reading something that wasn't super earnest and sincere and delightful. And I think that they were perfect books like if you have a reluctant reader um a young elementary kid that just isn't like a huge fan of reading in general this is one of those it just will make you laugh it's a great book to read out loud to your kids um so i just coming kept coming back to that as one that it was a little different than anything i ever read as a kid and i think that that's why it stuck with me throughout the years i think i've also gained some insight into some changes you've made in the editorial department over the years. why don't you come <laughs> up on the left and down <laughs> why not wouldn't this be a better way of doing this <laughs> How about you, Rachel? My all-time favorite book from childhood is Little Women by mm-hmm. Louisa May Alcott. Mm-hmm. It's obviously a classic, um, but I loved it because I saw myself for the first time in a character that, um, I mean, Joe as this kind of like heroine of these stories. I could see her as like this writer, and I was the kid who always wanted to like write stories and create kind of like families that I would write books about. And then um, to see her kind of be independent, but then also to see like the sisterly relationships play out. I never, I don't have a sister, so that was fun to kind of feel like I could, I don't know, just experience that, like, they're all their different relationships, and um, I kind of just, like, loved her independent, like, stubborn streak, and that's a another book that I come back to often, um, and always look at used bookstores for, like, the really pretty classic versions of it, and I've accumulated quite a few that I just keep on my shelf because they're beautiful, and that book is so good, so. Are you excited for the coming miniseries? I, I was talking about this. I'm honestly not. I don't Aww. like, I treasure the book so much. Because you're not a I'm visual not, interpretation kind I'm of person. Not. I don't really want it to be ruined. I'd rather just keep the way that they look and the way that they were in my mind 
just untainted, and I don't want a show to ruin it. I'm sure it will be great, but I probably won't watch it. But Kelly, you love that book, too. I do love that book. I deliberately didn't pick that book for any category mm-hmm. because I knew you would talk about it. <laughs> um, but it is probably my favorite childhood book, and when I do reread, it would also be in the category of reread mm-hmm. over and over. It's mm-hmm. just, I, for, for many of the same reasons, just feeling like you feel yourself in a character. Yeah. Um, and just, I don't know, Marmy is my literary heroine. I just love her and I aspire to be her as a mom too. And so just, it's a delightful book, but I am very excited about the Little Women. I have no problem with visual interpretations. I think I can just separate them in my mind. I don't reread a book and then think about the characters as they are portrayed in any type of movie or TV series. Mm-hmm. So for me, it isn't as much of an issue. But I do realize that some people have an have aversion to So many to of it. our editors have, have stated that this yeah. book was a, <laughs> a, a, you know, a touchstone for them. Yeah, yeah, no. truly. It's a good one. Mm-hmm. All right, so next category, a book you reread every year. Steve, let's start with you. Oh, my gosh. Well, it, it, this is... As, a, as an adult, there are very few books I re, reread every year, and the ones that I do are more practical. They're not a lot of fun to read. And <laughs> the, probably the the one exception, like other than the dictionary and the thesaurus and stuff like that, <laughs> as yeah, I read every, the dictionary, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or like practical project management, man, you know, mm-hmm. kinds of kinds of books. Uh, the one I do go back to all the time, though, that it's a it is that way and it's not that way is. Uh, a book uh, entitled "Bird by Bird" by mm-hmm. Anne Lamott. And I don't know if uh, I don't know if you guys are or how familiar you are with Anne Lamott, but she is a um, uh, I, I believe she's a Christian, and she's mm-hmm. she's written uh, a lot about writing, and and she's uh, pretty well known. She's not like politically. She I think she and, and theologically I think she's uh, on the more liberal side of things. But she's one of the most brilliant writers. Mm-hmm. Um, who who's who's lived I think in in recent times and people just love her work and um, her book this book was written a long time ago um, it was one of her first books and it was it's basically the, it's the subtitle is some instructions on writing in life and uh, back earlier in my life when I was like on a different career path and just sort of wrestling with you know what I think I want to be a writer I said that out loud to somebody. At one point, who just like, who was a writer and whose eyes lit up and said, "Oh my gosh, if you want to be a writer, this is the book you have to read." <laughs> it's Bird by Bird by Anne Lamott, and you know the, some of the language is a little salty, but it's it's really good. And what it, what she does in the book is breaks down like how to uh, how to write in in such an engaging and anecdotal way. But she also the, the what she talks about. Um, it is it applies to really getting things done in life. And she's got a, there's a lot of interesting little hints and tidbits in there, and um, it's it's not it, it's it's billed as a book that helps people write stories, but I feel like it's it's much deeper than that. And as it, one of her um, oldest works, and I think one of her first books that uh, people have always respected. And I see it on a lot of lists of here's what you need if you want, need to read if you want to be a writer. And I've, I've just always loved it. And I, I go back to it. It's, it's one of the ones I go back to year after year and just like for a fun hour or two, just re-remember like those times in my life when I was reading this going, yeah, I think I want to, I think I want to try that. I want to, I want to, I want to write. I want to be an editor. So, um, that, that will always be a, a very meaningful book to me. That's so interesting to me because while I'm not familiar with that book, I have read books about writing or essays about writing from Joan Didion or Stephen King, for example, that, like you said, oh, they, yeah. they tend to re- somehow uh, bleed over into the, just the issues of life and basic productivity. The good ones and, do. Yeah. yeah. And the, the, the premise of Bird by Bird is that you, you can stress yourself out by looking at everything as a big, huge project that you can't conquer. But if you break things down... Uh, into small steps, you'll you'll be much more successful at it. And um, I also really love Stephen King's book on writing as well. It's 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 very similar, except that you know Stephen King's path when life is yes, a little different. bit different. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> Sean, how about you? Okay. Well, <laughs> <laughs> while I have read my whole life, I am a very slow reader, and so I don't tend to read a lot of things over and over again. There's a lot of books that have meant a lot to me. But the one that um, in my house we read and listen to on audiobook and watch the movies 
of over and over again is one that I used to preach against until I was <laughs> 40 years old, uh, and that is the entire Harry Potter series. Mm-hmm. And, um, Are we allowed to pick an entire series, or do you have you, to name your favorite? If you read, read all of them. Well, I'll, I can pick my favorite of the series, like you did with the Silver Chair in Narnia. All but, right. And, and that would be The Order of the Phoenix. Um, mm. But um, because that's the book for me where in the series when I decided, based actually on knowing a lot of Christian people here who I really respected, who said, no, 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 you're, you've got the wrong idea about this. You're actually going to be surprised when you find out it's a Christian story. That was the... The fifth book in the series was where that really started taking off for me, and I started seeing so many parallels and and uh, really enjoying it. And um, and then my wife uh, got into it too. She's all like, oh, "What? This is amazing!" I, I don't. And we 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 make so many connections to our our own walk with the Lord through through this silly you know book series that was written for children in in the nineties and. Uh, um, I, it's, we just have to keep coming back to it. We can't get enough of it. So uh, that's it's just it's got a very special place in our house. Uh, my wife and I now make regular pilgrimages to Universal to to visit <laughs> the lands there. And and uh, I, I never I never would have guessed. And and it's been a real lesson to me to you know get to know anything first before you condemn it. Because when you know I, I young person in my twenties, all the kids are reading this book about going to learn to become witches. Well, that's, that's horrible. That, that sounds awful. It's not what you think. Yeah. I feel like we could have a whole, we always say this, I feel like every episode, we could have a separate conversation about, about just this, that. But, but banned books and, and mm-hmm. what, you know, what, what are the merits of actually reading a book before you write it off? And mm-hmm. is it, I think books can be a safe way to explore some of those things without, you know, I don't know, com- succumbing to whatever temptation people fear you're going to succumb to. So, but mm-hmm. I agree. Harry Potter is wonderful and masterfully, masterfully written and just a joy. Yeah. So. Many tears is in the last two books as I was yes. going, oh my gosh, that's just like this. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, for me, I would have also probably said Harry Potter as one. Um, but another one that I thought of right away was Screw Tape Letters by C.S. Mm-hmm. Lewis, which I feel like is probably... Lewis's most popular book after Narnia, just one that I think is beloved by many because of the way that he so masterfully, I mean, he always talks about theological concepts in a really accessible way, but I think he does it best in screw tape letters. Um, if you're not familiar with it, it's a fictional satirical book that was written as a, in a series of letters from a um, demon called screw tape writing to his nephew, kind of an under demon, a demon in training, Wormwood, um, and basically talking about, okay, how do we keep humans, or as he calls them, patients, um, from a saving faith? And what would that look like in a daily way of temptations and trials? And um, it's one that it just helps. It helped me. I read it kind of as a newer Christian, and it kind of helped take those concepts which are hard to understand and unpack them in a way that helped me see them with fresh eyes and in an imaginative way that helped me understand them, I think, in my daily life. And it's one that I just, I feel like I think of as we're in small group together talking about problems. I think, oh, I remember C.S. Lewis talking about this in the screw tape letters and mm-hmm. here's how you can apply this in real life. So always a book I come back to and really enjoy and appreciate. That's my favorite C.S. Lewis book that's nonfiction. Yeah. yeah. Okay. He has such an amazing grasp on the nature of man mm-hmm. and what man is like and what our hearts are like. And I think there's no other book that he's written that's more that's more evident than screw tape letters. It's mm-hmm. just brilliant. And so many people over the years have tried to knock it off and then do more yeah, letters. Do and that kind of thing. Don't do that. Nobody yeah. do that <laughs> no. anymore. You cannot be C.S. Lewis. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I almost included mere Christianity. We almost had a big, just because it could have been our favorite Lewis book mm-hmm. section today. Oh, no, yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. How about you, Rachel? Were you going to talk about it? I was, yeah. uh-huh. but I won't. Um, <laughs> mere Christianity is one that I read every year and I love dearly. Um, that's my favorite Lewis book. But... Um, another book that I reread often is um, Flannery O'Connor's Prayer Journal. Um, I have read all of her complete works and like all of the short stories that she's written, and um, I'm a big fan of her. I think a lot of the kind of darker, a little more like twisted, offbeat themes show up in her books, which I appreciate. And um, I just appreciate her as somebody that um, wrote as a younger woman and had, um, I don't know, I guess like in this stage in my life in my early 20s, she died young. Um, I always wish we could read more from her, but I love that what I get to read from her is from her at about the same stage of life that I'm in now. Um, And this prayer journal is just um, amazingly written. It's so poignant and beautiful. It's just really a collection of um, 
heard prayers from her own journal. And so I think reading things that weren't meant to be written or like read by the public, like you can tell that she wrote them just in a very honest conversation with God. And um, she writes a lot of prayers focused on her writing and that the Lord would like use her through her writing. And as a writer, I really find that meaningful. And I kind of reading her these prayers for the first time realized like how little I had been praying about my writing. And this kind of struck a chord with me that, um, there's a quote, like she talks about being used as like an instrument, um, like her typewriter would be used for God's glory. And Mm -hmm. it really just has resonated with me. And it's one that I come back to is just her prayers kind of offer a way into a new kind of prayer for me. So it's very, it's a short book, but very worth a read. Awesome. Okay. Let's go on to our last category, which is summer read. So this is one that like we talked about would be good as more of a lighthearted or just easy to read, just something you'd pick up and enjoy on vacation at some point. So Rachel, do you want to go first on that one? Sure. Um, I don't know if you would classify this as a lighter read, but I'm going to say it anyway. Um, I have become a huge personality type nerd over the years and find them fascinating and really helpful just to like understand who I am and who other people are. Um, So a new book that I have loved and come back to often is The Road Back to You by Ian Morgan Cron and Suzanne Stabile. And they focus on the Enneagram, which is a really helpful, more faith-based personality typing tool that talks a lot about um, kind of just more of the nuances of personality and kind of how you move and flow with times of stress and times of security and um, coming back to just kind of how we find freedom from that, find freedom from our, like, greatest sins and – This book is one of the more accessible – in the terms of Enneagram books, it is a more lighthearted option. Um, It's very easy to read. It's really easy to kind of connect with and find yourself in. There's great stories and anecdotes throughout. And this is one that I've recommended to many, many people. We've gone through it in my mentoring group, and it just keeps coming back up. Um, I love their podcast as well. So if that's more a speed of like, I'd rather listen to a podcast on the beach instead of read a book, that Mm -hmm. could be helpful too. But I've just really found it a fascinating look at more of who I am and how other people are and how we can relate better. So highly recommend The Road Back to You. I recently awesome. took that test and found out my Enneagram. Mm. Um, what is your Enneagram? So I can't remember. Oh, I know. I think Perfect. I'm a four. Was I a four? I you can't might be a four. Okay, yeah. I yeah. would love to talk four. about that so, on another podcast. I know, podcast. on another podcast. <laughs> yeah. We'll add that to the list if you care. Sean's a four. That means absolutely. I know, right. Yeah. It's, <laughs> but one day it will. Mm-hmm. Um, Sean, what would you pick? Uh, so I'll take you back to the summer of 1993. Mm, uh, I, it's I'm between my my uh, right before I started my final year of, of college. I was working at a, a Christian summer youth camp, and uh, one weekend we we only got 24 hours off each weekend. We went and saw Jurassic Park, <laughs> and uh, and gr- you know life changing movie. Oh, awesome movie! So I had to read the book. And this is one of a few instances in my life. I know we've had this discussion before, yes, Steve. Yes, we have. <laughs> um, where I was very glad that I had seen a movie before I'd seen the book, and then very glad that it was a different story. So I could I could picture the characters in my heads. Unlike Rachel, I actually like to do this: picture the characters from the the movie as the ones in the in the book. Um, but then you know it's it's deeper. You get more of the science in the book, and it, the different endings and different things happen. Um, and I, I uh, I probably shouldn't admit this in case any of my old colleagues at camp are listening, but I I may have faked an illness for a day in sick bay to to finish this book. It was it was so good, so uh, it was um yeah it was awesome. I, I loved that book, and that was so to me that was summertime, and that was my summertime read, and mm-hmm. and just in conjunction with the film, uh, it was uh I was like wow this is great stuff. I love dinosaurs because mm. <laughs> when I was a kid that's what I read over and over was my dinosaur books. books. Oh mm-hmm. I love it. I lo- I love that book. Too. I wrote mm-hmm. it in high school before the movie came out and thought, how in the world is this not a movie? And then I had to read all of Michael Crichton's books. But mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. Cool. Steve, how about you? Um, I am at a point, point in my life where I read a lot more fiction now than I ever have before, just because I'm just fascinated with story and how people put stories together. And um, But I, for, for my summer read, what I would recommend is not fiction. Uh, but it is an amazing story. Uh, it's some narrative history that I, I've, uh, I read when it first came out about 15 years ago, and, and just still keep going back to. And that's a book called Ghost Story, uh, Ghost Ghost Soldiers, by uh, Hampton Sides. Now, Ghost Soldiers is the story of a rescue in a rescue mission in World War II, and it's Hampton Sides is an amazing narrative writer of history. Um, it it reads like an adventure novel. It's 
It's a, a, gr a large group of soldiers have to go behind enemy lines in the Philippines to rescue some POWs because they feel that it's at the end of World War II and they feel the Japanese are going to start murdering all of the, the people in prison camps because they can't take care of them anymore. So um, it's, it's, a fanta it's, a, it's a story I'd never heard of, and I love these little vignettes of history that get uh, remembered like this, where it's like, we don't talk about this much, but did you know that like a hundred soldiers snuck behind enemy lines wow. and not only mm -hmm. got like several hundred miles to where they needed to go, but then rescued like 500 POWs out of those camps who couldn't even walk hardly and got them back to, you know, where they needed to be, where they were safe. It's just, it's a, it's a fun story in that it's, it's exciting and um, most people don't know about it. And they actually eventually did a movie uh, about it that I don't remember the name of because it wasn't a very good retelling <laughs> of the story. But uh, the book is Ghost Soldiers. It's one of my favorite. It's, it's not necessarily light reading but it's a it's a quick read because it's written so well and um it's it's a it's an, a fun little um vignette of history that i think people need to know about so great what about you kelly yeah, for me, um, last summer I started reading the Louise Penny Inspector Gamache mystery novels, and um, this is just it's such a great little series, and I actually stopped reading them. There's 12 of them right now, and I think I stopped at book six because I wanted to wait until this summer to finish them. I wanted to savor them a little bit um, because they are the, just the perfect summer read, just easy to read and just delightful little stories, but they all follow the story of Chief, Chief Inspector Amar Gamache. He's a Canadian police chief who's solves murder mysteries in the fictional town of Three Pines, which is a little province in Quebec. And it's just as delightful and cozy and um, good stories as you would think they are there. I've never actually been into mystery novels. I've never read Grisham or really? Agatha Christie. Yeah, I've never read oh, a man. single one. Um, but we I can just, have a whole podcast about um, Agatha Christie. Yeah, yeah, I know. We could. Um, but I just fell in love with these and they... Um, they, you know, I love the character development of it. I love um, Gamash, who is really kind of a Dumbledore-esque type character really? of just like older and wiser and kind of helps out his team, kind of takes along these rag ragamuffin recruits and, and trains them up and just enjoy that um, perspective on it. And yeah, I just really love them. The first in the series is called A Still Life. And we'll be sure to link to that book and all the books that we've mentioned to in our show notes. Um, just so you guys can check these out. I think that all of these are, none of them are new or recent ones. So you should be able to find all of them in your local library, which is kind of fun. Um, I need to ask you a question. Are these, yeah. are these like, uh, written, uh, like for, for young adult audiences or, or no, for, it's for adults. They yeah. are. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, but but at the same time, they're not violent or okay, particularly right. grotesque. I can't read or stomach anything that is, you know, has violence or vulgarity or anything like mm -hmm. that. And they're very clean books. But at the same time, just really interesting and, and just good stories too. Wow. So, yeah. Well, I think that brings us to the end of our show. Thank you, everybody, for for sharing your uh, favorite books and along with your hopes and dreams. And uh, we hope that uh, folks out in the audience will uh, check some of these books out. Uh, thank you to Kelly, Rachel, Sean for, for joining me today. Thanks to Stephen Sanders and Kyle Fletcher, our audio engineers. Uh, you guys can follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash crosswalk podcast. And please share your uh, favorite books on the, uh, the Facebook post for this episode. Uh, to find out more on the topics that we talked about today or to listen to past episodes, be sure to visit our site, insidetheeditorsroom.com. And be sure to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Google Play, TuneIn, or SoundCloud to get our latest episodes downloaded right to your phone. Thanks for listening.